the previous videos that I did leading up to and finishing with Left Behind were going to be the entirety of my walkthrough series as far as um, The Last of Us Part 1 was concerned because obviously it took you through to the end of the game and then took you through the Left Behind DLC as well. But I'm making this extra video because a lot of the kind of community that you interact with in terms of other people who take on play last of us and do last of us challenge runs in particular are people who understandably play a lot more of last of us part two than part one and so i thought it would be useful to do this video and kind of talk in more general terms about the differences between the two because there are some bits in terms of the mechanics and systems that are significantly different in ways that whether you're using my strats or what you want to use that as a starting point for kind of evolving your own strats on part one those differences are going to be important so i'm going to try and talk to them talk about them as much as i can here and kind of um cover through every single one of the major differences obviously there's a lot of stuff that is the same in terms of how like enemies behave enemy ai stuff like that and then other stuff which is specific to individual encounters which again i'll refer back to my full walkthrough videos and also the general guide to the mechanics but again just kind of the very big significant things that are different between the two and if you're used to one it's worth being aware of the differences if you're not used to the other so with that let's go through so if we start off with stealth, because the big obvious difference here is the fact that we don't have any prone, which means that stealth operates in a different way. So the kind of obvious applications of that are there's not really any lower cover to hide behind. It's all kind of crouching level stuff like this uh, tipped over machine that we can see here. There's, if we're behind something like this, we can't be seen. Or the more kind of difficult part will be with clickers as a very specific example so if you're stealthing up to clickers in part two the easiest way to do that is to prone up to them and then spam triangle when you're right by them uh with clickers here as we can see when i just do this if you try and crouch walk very quietly it can be stop and start because you're like not 100 sure exactly how much pressure you want to put on the stick and i'm moving extremely slowly here but even with this if i inadvertently like move slightly too fast then it creates that panic moment and, and the clicker reacts and now we're in a chaotic situation that we don't want to be in and obviously the result is death um so it is possible to move, like just move the stick very lightly and get past but um and i didn't really cover this in the tutorial videos when i made them i think i just talked about using the stick very lightly or i mentioned it in passing but one way in which you can use the movement tech is if you take a bottle and aim like this we'll go past the clicker and there'll be no like i'm fully pressing the stick here and there's no issue with it and then i can move past without any difficulty test watch my back However, if I try and do that, so again, I need to be very quiet on the stick, which means I move a lot slower, as you can see. So, again, that movement tech with the aiming, and it does work with guns as well, although. 
you can feel a lot clunkier doing that. But yeah. Again, we've got no issue with fully pressing the stick and moving around. So that works as a useful alternative to the prone. Which takes us over. Ah, that's a problem. Wait. So, yeah. That's the main only thing I want to say on stealth, really, is just that it's worth being aware of that movement tech. Although, there is one caveat with that, and that is if you get too close to a clicker, to this you will. Like I say, he's fine there. But... If we get too close to the point where we want to trying press triangle to shoot him then we could see he was starting to get a lead and i have had it before we using that and getting too close before you start spamming triangle if you try and get a kill from behind if they're moving around has resulted in getting alerted so that can present difficulties there so that's just worth being aware of but that essentially is the main thing to know about stealth in the face of a lack of prone In terms of melee combat, the main thing that people know, obviously, is that there is no dodge in this game. This has advantages and disadvantages. So, obviously, Joel can't dodge out of the way of a fast-moving attack. But it also means once you're locked into melee, there's not really a situation where the enemy will force you to dodge in the way that happens in Part 2, where they'll kind of tank one hit and then start hitting back, so you need to press dodge. Um, so let's just take this guy out. So, when we go into a melee kind of combo with the guy here, him getting a hit in on us doesn't stop us being able to punch in the way that it would in part two. As we'd have to dodge out the way so we can just carry on and basically plow through it but um because we can't dodge we will have taken that little bit of damage there which you see by the fact that we need a health item um so the only thing that really happens is they will dodge your hits so if i come in here and start fighting with this guy they don't always dodge like they, they, that is a randomized move but we'll if we do it again with this again the fact that he got a hit in and we didn't dodge it didn't affect us but as you saw there he ducked under our swing and so the, we had to then press triangle to counter his move That's um, so which i did cover in the other in the other um videos but yeah that's the main difference so like the dodge or the lack of dodge isn't necessarily an all-out disadvantage it's just something that kind of means that you've got a different melee system to contend with essentially and in some ways it's an easier melee system because like in in part two if you got taken that first hit and not dodged it then the likelihood of you taking a second hit and not having the room to press square to, to throw a punch or throw a knife swing with, as Ellie um, would be higher. Whereas with part one, you can just start punching and it'll largely go in your favor at that point. Hey, consolidated the crate in the South Warehouse. Supplies are locked up. Good. However, head out. another key difference, which is a lot more disadvantageous. Um, as we're about to see, is the fact that 
if you come up behind someone as, in stealth as Ellie or Abby in part two and press square, you'll do a melee strike, which will kill them. Um, unless it's a clicker, in which case it'll require two hits. But So you come behind and you press square and it like bashes the head in or stab them in the head or something like that as Ellie. Whereas if we come behind and press square as Joel here, all that happens is we start punching and a normal fight happens. And the only difference is if you have a brick or a bottle, if you do like press square there, you can knock them down to a stun. But yeah. Essentially, if you're coming behind them in stealth, the thing you will want to do is to grab them and strangle them, not to try and take that quick strike kill. Now, if you're not in stealth, you do have a different option, which is to throw the bottle at them. To stun them, and that will allow you to knock them down, but it doesn't work exactly the same. Again, if you throw a bottle at someone in part two and they're stunned, uh, like I say, unless it's a clicker at full health, you will melee kill them in one hit when you press square. But here, it takes two. It punches down and then does the kick, which is the finish off. So it, it takes slightly longer, it's not exactly the same. And just to demonstrate that point again, we throw the bottle. And one, two. Now, with the enemies stunned by a brick or a bottle, taking two hits rather than one to finish them off. Um, the other difference that makes is that if you are stunning a clicker, you can't do what you can do in part two, which is where if there are full health, you do a strike, but it would take off half the health and you need to stun them again and do a second strike to kill them. If you try that with a clicker here, let's just strangle this one and then go to the clicker and kind of prove the point. So if you strangle this, um, so if we stun the clicker by throwing something, then when we go up, The only thing that happens is we get killed. We don't have any kind of maneuver that we use, either like Ellie stabbing the clicker in the in the uh, shoulder and then the clicker breaks free and then you've got time to run away, or like Abby doing like a more heavy melee hit, which again results in the same thing, and then you got a chance to stun them twice. You just they're stunned, and if you don't have a melee weapon to kill them with, you die. If we stun them, and we have a melee weapon, then they die. And that's a lock quicker, as you can see again, with any enemy than without a melee weapon. Again, one hit and they're dead, so you don't have that same thing. So there is a, a, that difference. Um, and the, when you've got a melee weapon, it plays largely right, like part two, in that you... Uh, are able to kill them in one, but when you, it's just your fists, it takes two strikes to be able to kill them from the stun state. And if they're a clicker and they're in a stun state and you don't have a melee weapon, do not try to hit them. However, a lot of people do know this trick already, but it bears repeating. One thing that Joel can do in part one, that's a significant difference between the brick and bottle, which doesn't really exist in part two, is the fact that the brick is a one hit kill uh, a three hit kill rather so to just demonstrate this we'll uh, again get the same clicker once we got its friends out the way and we can use the movement tech here to get close to it and then as soon as we're close, press square, 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 and it's down. Just to stress, this only works with bricks, so I'll demonstrate the point with the bottle once you can see immediately why it only works with bricks and what happens 
if you have a bottle. So again, we will strangle these two and get them out of the way. We won't pick up the brick this time. We will pick up the bottle that's a bit ahead. And because we've not got the brick, we have to move slower. But yeah, so we'll use... We'll come up here with the bottle. And we go for the bottle and press square. It instantly breaks. And then we're trying to hit the clicker again. It kills us. So make sure you have a brick and not a bottle if you're taking on a clicker. So one of the things that you'll probably notice fairly early on is that upgrades within The Last of Us Part 1 work very differently to The Last of Us Part 2 um, in terms of upgrades on benches, upgrades in regards to gun holsters, kill upgrades, uh, training manuals, and also melee weapon upgrades. So to kind of round out the melee combat discussion, we'll start with the melee weapon upgrades. As you can see here with the first one we find, you don't have to upgrade your with pills in order to be able to add upgrades to melee weapons you just have to find one that's already upgraded so that's the first kind of difference to how they work in part two um the other difference here is the the upgrade doesn't do what it does in part two where it restores the durability of the weapon and means that every single hit that's left is an improved hit that does more damage off usually a one hit kill instead it gives you that one hit kill as the upgrade on top of whatever the existing durability is so this durability of this weapon here is full um but if i had say taken three of the hits off it in killing another enemy and then upgraded it those three hits wouldn't be restored it'd still be um down to the remaining five hits on the main weapon plus one upgraded hit so the upgraded hits uh go from one when you first pick up the weapon to three once you found two training manuals in order to increase the durability of them but once they're gone as we'll see in a second uh you're just left with the weapon as it was before the upgrade so there's two clickers in this area who can serve as a quite useful demonstration of this so if we go to the first one we'll see that because we've got the upgraded weapon and we'll alert it just to show that this isn't isn't just in stealth. One hit and that clicker is dead. But when the other one comes to us and we hit it with the pipe, which has now lost its upgrade. It takes four hits. So let's talk about the Shiv Master upgrade, because this is one that again People have used shivs playing as Abby in part two may be familiar with the kind of function where, as well as being able to use them for a quick stealth kill, particularly on clickers, um, you can use them when grabbed to in order to escape. And this upgrade here uh, is what allows you to do it. And we'll kind of demonstrate this very quickly. As we have two shivs there. So first of all, let's demonstrate it on this clicker here. That breaks the street, but it does not kill the clicker. Now, okay, so. In the remastered version of Last of Us Part 1, the Shiv Master upgrade used to result in a glitch where if you went to swing at a clicker and you had the Shiv Master and you had a Shiv, it would interrupt your swing to kill um, and force a clicker to grab on you, which meant that you had to use a Shiv. Now, I was under the impression that this was still the case in the remake, although having tested it a couple of times here, it doesn't seem to be happening even with that um like i say that's not a guarantee that it doesn't happen at all ever um because this is quite early on and there are more and more intense clicker combat areas than the area where i was trying to demonstrate this so 
it may well be the case that it still emerges as an issue later. Either way, um, the advice that I gave in my walkthrough with not upgrading with Shiftmaster does still stand because it's not a useful um, kind of way to use your resources, essentially. Um, it is a st effectively a waste of a shiv um, because even if you get to the upgrade where it doesn't fully break the shiv when you use it, it will take off its durability, which means you have fewer of them for shiv doors. And as I talked about in the melee um, combat section earlier, the bricks are a lot more useful for killing clickers if you have to. And if you're trying to stealth kill, there's only really one area where you have it's unavoidable to use a shiv um otherwise you're not really going to be in that intense stealth to have to worry about that so if you're in combat that brick strike is a lot more effective than um waiting to get grabbed and using a shiv in retaliation uh and once you start it it does lock them into the animation so there's never really an issue i've never really had an issue with the brick strike being interrupted by the clicker that's running at you obviously be aware of your surroundings as another infected may interrupt it if they kind of right by you at the same time but you should always give yourself enough space to melee attack one to make sure you're not being attacked by other infected at the same time anyway so yeah that's the reason that's what shift master does um so being aware that you don't kind of have that ability automatically just because you can craft shivs but that's also why i don't think it's necessarily very useful toy from the toy box. now with regards to other upgrades in the last of us um again as in the last of us 2 you find training manuals you have benches where you can upgrade your weapons you find pills in order to upgrade joel's abilities but it does work somewhat different okay so with upgrading on workbenches in the last of us part one as opposed to part two the first and most immediate thing that you'll notice is that there are more upgrade paths for every single weapon rather than there being kind of one upgrade you can do for example to increase the capacity of the pistol one to increase the reload speed um and same with the other weapons each upgrade is effectively has multiple levels and those levels you can't increase on the basis of purely having enough parts you also need to find a level of tools so throughout the world as you travel around it you will find these toolboxes which i do point out where we find them in the walkthrough but um just as a kind of demonstration they all look like this and they have this uh, icon above the, the yellow um, pliers. So when you take whatever you find in that toolbox, that upgrades your tools level. You start from zero and build the way up to five. And then that combined with the parts that you find allows you to do various different upgrades. Let's do this. So some are more useful than others. And there's a more detailed discussion that I go into in the, in the walkthrough with that. But one thing to note here is that you need tools level one in order to be able to add the long gun holster and the short gun holster as you can see here um so upgrading that rather than being something you find in the world as you do with ellie and abby in part two that is something you need to utilize parts and a tools level in order to create um so again this is one of the reasons why i won't really use a workbench before this workbench in bill's town because by then you should have enough parts accumulated to be able to create both holsters at once um, and still have some to spare as well, depending on how many you picked up. But that means that if you want that um, ability to swap between two long guns and two short guns without having to go into your backpack, you've got that relatively early on in the game, um, both at the same time. So, as you can see now, we, we can do that um, easily, switching between the weapons. So, that's the main thing to be aware of with workbenches. Um, again, a lot more 
potential upgrades for every single weapon, um, including multiple levels of each of the upgrade types. Um, again, some will be more useful than others. That's something kind of you'll have to judge for yourself in terms of which ones you prefer, which ones you feel are more necessary, and so on. But uh, yeah, for me, getting that dual holster for long and short guns at this point in the game here when we're in Bill's safe house is probably the most important upgrade as far as that goes. Now, in terms of upgrading Joel, um, as with Ellie, as you can see here, there's a number of things you can do in terms of pills that will upgrade um, health, crafting speed, healing speed, weapon sway, and the Shiv Master upgrade that we've talked about in relation to upgraded melee weapons. Now, the only one of these that requires you to find a training manual in the world is the second Shiv Master upgrade. With the rest of them, uh, it's just a case of finding pills and being up to the appropriate level so you can upgrade uh, your maximum health to the second level once you've got 100 uh, more pills after you've got, I think it's 50 for the first health upgrade and so on. And it'll tell you kind of what the cost is for each of them. Um, so we'll just do that arbitrarily. And it, you can see kind of the next upgrade there is saying it'll cost 50. So as long as you find them in the world, you can upgrade. Um, there's no need for training manuals except for the second shift master upgrade, which is kind of a moot point if you do follow my kind of approach and not upgrade shift master at all. And in relation to that as well, um, the training manuals don't add new upgrade paths for pills. What they do instead, so again, using this one as an example, this um, increases the durability of blades. So what this does once we pick this up is means that using the shiv for a stealth kill is no longer single use. And we now have two uses per shiv. Um, and that happens automatically. We don't have to use pills to upgrade. We simply find the training manual and it does that for us. Um, and all of the different training manuals have that effect, whether it's the training manual that increases the length of time that smoke lingers after smoke bombs, whether it's the training manual that adds a couple of extra hits to your upgraded melee weapon and so on. As long as you find the training manual, there's nothing else you need to do. You've got the upgrade as a result of that, which is... Again, different from how it works in part two. So that, I think, covers everything in relation to the upgrades and how they work differently in part one compared to part two. The only other thing to note there is that we don't get any upgrade path for Ellie for the section that we play here, so that's not something you need to worry about in that winter section. But we'll come on to Ellie's gameplay in a minute. Now, in relation to gun combat in Last of Us 2, uh, in Last of Us 1, rather, the two guns that can kill enemies in one hit, regardless of distance, um, that you start get quite early on, are your revolver. Okay. Right, so... With the revolver, it's generally a one-hit kill on most enemies. Now, if you look here, when I shoot that guy, it didn't kill him because he's armored, whereas that guy dies instantly. Um, this is a good chance to talk about armored enemies um, because they have armor, obviously, on the they're wearing body armor, but if I shoot him in the leg, the one-hit kill... That applies to the revolver still oh, works so with armored human enemies if you shoot them out where they're not wearing armor in their legs then any gun that is a one hit kill will still one hit kill and that goes for the rifle as well as the revolver and later the uh, el diablo sniper rifle 
Now, Shotgun and Shorty are slightly different in that they're obviously a one-hit kill up a close range or at distance they won't but these two weapons if you get used to using them um despite them generally being slower particularly on reloading than other weapons that fact that they can one hit kill and that even if your enemy is armored they can kill as long as you hit somewhere that's not armored will come in extremely handy so that's something to be aware of is to take advantage um of that one hit kill and that one hit kill specifically in relation to the revolver only applies on grounded difficulty um the revolver on lower difficulties takes two hits generally to kill an unarmored enemy so that's just something to be aware of because that isn't something that you get even though you do technically get this revolver because ellie picks it up from joel um at the end of the jackson chapter it doesn't have the same power on grounded that it does on part one now the kind of other side to that as we'll demonstrate here is that whilst your weapons can kill the enemy in one hit in that way the enemy um can also one hit kill you with their guns as we can see uh here so particularly with the shotgun Uh, as we see, that does an awful lot of damage instantly. And then second shot kills. Now, more often than not, that one shot taking a lot of damage but not instantly killing it isn't something you actually see kind of when playing through the main game on Grounded. Um, in Encounters mode, it does feel like there's a little bit more leeway on that. Um, certainly from experience even at that distance the as we can see there that the first shot missed me entirely the second shot and I was dead so that's what's far more likely to happen with a shotgun if you, they are far enough away you may or if you are very lucky you may get what happened in the first instance which is that um, we got damaged to very low health, but we didn't instantly die. However, that is definitely less. I don't know why it's missing me so much there. There we go. When he finally hit me, it was a one hit kill. Um, you will also find that as well this seems to happen a lot like when you're in a situation where the stakes are relatively low like you're practicing on um, encounters mode it does seem like they miss more than they certainly do if you're playing a full run on grounded um, difficulty certainly I've never seen that happen like and certainly not a succession of misses like that when actually playing on ground of permadeath for example so even though it's kind of this rare demonstration of it here it's definitely not something you can rely on and that kind of additional demonstration there where we did get shot by the shotgun and it was enough it damaged us so much that one pistol bullet was enough to kill us after it so even if you do survive a shotgun hit you will want to heal straight away get out of the way of shots you don't want to be standing there as i did like a lemon which was obviously done on purpose to kind of demonstrate the point i'm hoping we'll get a demonstration of it here if we do this right there should be a guy with a shotgun up here who should be pretty much waiting for us And there you see, like I didn't take a single shot up to that point, and he still hit. Obviously, running right at him made him more accurate, but I did that specifically to demonstrate that if they don't miss, that's what's the most likely outcome if you are faced with a shotgun guy and not in cover. 
Now, the two other weapons that we want to talk about here um, are nail bombs and smoke bombs. Now, in part two, Ellie will have trap mines which she can place down and they will explode Finish it. Um, when an enemy walks nice by them. Done. And Abby has pipe bombs which, when thrown, Not explode today. on the target that you. they hit. Not today. Right. Nail bombs Spread effectively out. serve sure as both. So you can see we've thrown the bomb it doesn't explode straight away um but when this guy comes around that will be the results whereas just as well if we instead throw it directly at him then it will explode on impact if there is a human there you bit so not today you that's the kind of alternative way of using it. Both ways have the merits, but equally, as well as using the nail bomb by throwing it to a position, uh, you can also kind of place it down. If you press uh, R2 without aiming, it'll just throw to wherever near to Joel. So that way you don't have to bother with aiming to be able to precisely place it. And finally, smoke bombs are something that we also have in part two. However, they do function slightly differently. There are two reasons for this. One is that we don't have to upgrade them from stun bombs to smoke bombs. They are smoke bombs automatically. And the other is that when we throw them, they don't immediately impact. So if I throw it at this guy, he'll get stunned. And then there'll be an explosion afterwards. As you can see there. And then the smoke goes up like that so that's kind of how they function there um say it's a slight difference but it means that once you pick up smoke bombs you have smoke straight away you don't have to rely on them purely on stunt and also um again you get kind of two stuns out of them almost as you can see there when we threw that and i'll just do that again one more time just to demonstrate yeah that's all should have known but so as it hits one of them because it locks on just like a brick or a bottle or any other throwable so as it locks on one guy when it hits him it stuns him just by the fact that it hits him and then the follow-up stuns the rest so That allows us to take advantage of the moment as that. I mean, that's not the strategy we'd pursue in this area in general, but just as a demonstration for that particular point. Now, finally, with regard to Ellie, and I'll use left behind here just because it's easier to get to the um, moments quickly and find like one where I can demonstrate the point, but it works the same in the winter section of the main game as well. Um, there are a couple of things so now firstly let's deal with clickers now if you throw a brick or a bottle at a fully a clicker who's got full health on, the, on part two and then stab it it will generally shrug off that stab and you'll have to do it again a second time with ellie you get to instantly Kind of kill it in that way uh, and don't have to worry about it so we'll pick up a bottle and demonstrate this again this clicker i've done no damage to And it dies. Um, but what we'll also demonstrate here is that the other side of this, Ellie not being Joel, is that we cannot melee an enemy, whether it's human or infected. If we go up and try and stab, the main thing there is we get grabbed. And... I 
think we were very lucky there to actually be able to kill because we escaped but um that's specific to infected because if we try melee with humans uh well i'll show you the difference so with ellie i'll demonstrate this i'll stun this guy but then let him recover Got you now, asshole. and again he'll go for a grab quite quickly which if i can escape i can then stab him however if the guy throws punches at us we'll try and see if we can go with him into doing that here now he goes for a grab again right again we'll let him that three punch combo there even if on full health will generally kill ellie so um it's hard to see there because obviously he grabbed his face, which took a lot of damage, but... Here we go. And there you see, like, they were hesitant for some reason, but the effect is the same. Those kind of, it'll take three hits, essentially, to um, kill Ellie in that way. You will see it more aggressive with the guys who don't have guns, so that might be easier to show... So this guy doesn't have a gun. So as soon as we show ourselves, She's over here. he will try and run at us. Or he should try and run at us. Of course, as soon as I'm trying to record a demonstration of this for tutorial purposes, NPCs decide to act weird and run away. Okay, another, this other one is being more aggressive, as they should. So, yeah. They'll charge up and try and grab like that. Sometimes. I'm gonna pay for this, you little shit. Let's see how much health we can restore. I just want that guy to be more aggressive. Come on. Don't know why he's. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> this I'm keeping this in because this NPC is behaving very erratically like he wouldn't have run away from that third punch normally but yeah if you take the aggressiveness of the guy I killed earlier with the punches that that guy did that's what they usually do <laughs> again you do occasionally when you try and demonstrate these things the game goes out of its way to show you all sorts of weird and erratic behavior but that's essentially the main risk with Ellie she cannot melee and will um, be vulnerable to either a grab or a punch in that same way. Um, so there we go. So that's pretty much everything to do with Ellie's side of things. And yeah, other than that, she obviously doesn't behave in the same way as Joel does or as she does in part two. Um, she's a lot kind of weaker character relying on guns and distance. But yeah, being aware of those things in relation to melee on the one hand and on the other hand the fact that it's easier to kill the likes of clickers if you've got that kind of bottle of brick knife combination um that kind of covers things which will be very useful for kind of getting out of all situations sorts of situations with ellie so that kind of covers everything that's different as far as part one to part two like i say i do have other videos which go into a lot more detail on the mechanics of part one specifically and kind of the things you need to know and general hints and tips both on the game in general and on grounded in particular um so definitely check those videos out for more detailed tutorials and if you want walkthroughs of the specific encounters and specific strats do check out the videos i put out before this one on this playlist that detail like kind of how to get through the entirety of the main game and left behind on grounded difficulty but hopefully especially if you're someone who's played a lot of the last of us part two and are more used to that then this video highlighting these differences will be useful to you so that's kind of everything that i wanted to cover here um so hopefully it's all useful hopefully it helps you get on with it, the game a lot better um and yeah other than that i'll leave it there and enjoy the game if you enjoyed this video then please give it a like and consider subscribing to keep up to date with all my content like the video that just popped up, which YouTube thinks you should watch next. This is a Patreon and member supported channel, so if you want to become a member and unlock custom badges and emojis, early access to my videos, and your name in the credits, then click the join button below. Thanks very much for watching, and see you next time!